Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Prasad Kata. Dr. Kata is an endocrinologist and medical director of the Washington Outpatient Diabetes Center. Hi, good morning. How are you all doing? Good, excellent. Okay, so they wanted to give, ask me to give this talk about standards of care. This will mainly be pertinent to patients who have diabetes. I won't be talking anything about pre-diabetes or any other thing here. So basically what the talk will entail is that, okay, so over the course of the year, what all a diabetic patient needs to get done from their doctor or what all you need to achieve, make sure you're healthy and so on and so forth. As you know, A1C is the, the term we use for most patients who have diabetes. We want them to sort of look where their A1C is. And usually you want their A1C to be less than seven. And if no hypoglycemia, which is there's no low blood sugars, we can strive for a lower A1C. Seven is the minimum standard and if you don't have any low sugars we definitely can strive for a lower A1C. I'll come into the little bit later as to okay who will need a higher A1C and who can have lower A1Cs. And how often you need to check it? You have to check it at least every six months if you're controlled and if you're not controlled maybe every three to four months. So this is a slide which shows the A1C and the corresponding level of blood sugars. So if you look at it here, 5% is about 97, 7% is about 154 blood sugar, 9 is about 212, and if you go 13% is about 326, and so on. So the higher the A1C, the higher your blood sugar is. So a little explanation of A1C. So what is A1C? Sometimes patients come and ask me, how, how do you know my blood sugar for the last three months? So the answer is depicted in this figure here. So usually the red blood cells, which has a lifespan of about 90 to 120 days, is coated with blood sugar. So the higher the blood sugar in one's body or patient's body who has diabetes, the higher your A1C will be. So that is how we try to find out what, whose A1C is high or whose A1C is normal and so on and so forth. There are certain conditions which, which can actually spuriously lower your A1C. If someone had a, a bleeding episode, things like that, yes, because you're losing blood and new blood cells are being formed, new red blood cells are being formed, your A1C can be lower. But it's not very often that happens. So this was the slide which I wanted to show you, like in all patients are not the same with respect to where the A1C should be. Definitely some patients who have risk, higher risk factors, like they have kidney disease, they have heart disease, we can definitely have their A1Cs a little bit higher because the reason is if these patients have low sugars, they are at a higher risk for death. So we don't want that. So what I was trying to explain is disease duration is one. If they have diabetes only for three, four, or five years, yes, we can strive for a high, lower A1C. If they've had diabetes for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, then we are okay with a higher A1C. Relevant comorbidities, that which I explained, cardiovascular, renal, so on and so forth, if they have heart disease, if they have kidney disease, and patient attitudes and expected treatment efforts. If someone is not motivated, we don't want to have their A1C too low because of low sugars, if they don't want to check their sugars, and they can be repeatedly going into the hospitals and so on and so forth. And resource and support system also. If someone, if if I get a person who is like 80, 85 years old, male or female, and they live by themselves and they're on insulin, then I have to be careful as a physician not to 
prescribe for a very low A1C, we can accept even seven and a half or eight in such a patient. So what are the goals for blood sugars? Usually we want it to be 90 to 130 before meals and in the morning. And we also want patients to check their blood sugars two hours after eating. A lot of times, even my patients, they come to me and they have blood sugars, everything done in the morning. We don't want that. It's not like brushing teeth and forgetting it. We want, we, we want your blood sugars after meals. We want your blood sugars at bedtime to see where your numbers are. And how often to check? It depends upon how many medications, what medications they are on. Oral medications, probably you can just do once or twice a day, or maybe even once a day if you're controlled, you should be fine. If you're on insulin, usually we say three times a day, maybe even it may be four or five times. So different ways to check the blood sugars. Still most of the patients use blood sugar monitors. Some of these are the ones which I typically use. There are many other pharmacy brand and generic meters. You can also use continuous glucose monitors. And they're usually for patients with insulin but the coverage is getting better. And Medicare does cover uh, the continuous glucose monitors for patients who are on insulin, and they need to satisfy certain criteria. You have to check your blood sugars at least four times a day for 30 days to qualify for it, and you should be on insulin. And these are some of the brands, Freestyle Libre, Dexcom, and Medtronic has one too. So I'm sure when you go into the physician's office, they check your blood pressure. And this is very important, again, this, because you, we need to control your blood pressure. At least the goal is less than 130 by 80. That's the generally accepted goal. And every visit, you want to get your blood pressure done. And there are multiple medications may be used to treat blood pressure. And some of the important ones or the most common ones which are used in patients with diabetes are the ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, benazepril, and the ARB receptor antagonists like Lozartan, Valsartan, and Ibizartan. All these are generic medications. And these not only control the blood pressure, but they also control, they do give kidney protection to patients who have diabetes. There are many other groups of medications, I won't go into the list, to control blood pressure. And as I said, you may need more than one medication. You may need two or three medications to control blood pressure. So cholesterol, some of you or a lot of you did get your cholesterol checked. The one which was done earlier on in the morning was total cholesterol. So we usually don't go with the total cholesterol in patients with diabetes. We want what is called the LDL or the least desirable cholesterol. So this is, you, we want it less than 100 for lower risk patients or even less than 70 for higher risk patients. If you come to my office, I'll say less than 70. So 100 is okay unless you really don't want to take higher dose of medications, but less than 70 is definitely better. You also want to get your HDL, which is a part of the lipid panel that is your highly desirable cholesterol. For men, it needs to be more than 40 and women greater than 50. The most common medications used are statins. Some of you may be on it. And if you are, you want to look at the guidelines here and see if you do, are doing okay there with your cholesterol. So the good news is managing the A, B, C, A, st a, stand, a stands for A1C, B is for blood pressure, and C is for the cholesterol. You can definitely reduce the risk of complications with diabetes. A1C, as I said, less, less than 7 for most patients. Blood pressure less than 130 by 80 and C, which cholesterol less than 100 or even 70, depending upon the risk factors. So this is a slide which shows that a 1% drop in the A1C. This is a slide from the UK PDS data, which was done in the United Kingdom. It was in the late 90s. A 1% drop in the A1C, you decrease your risk for any complications like eyes, kidneys, or nerve damage by about 25 to 30%. So from nine, you go to eight, you decrease it. Again, from eight, you go to seven, you decrease it another 25 to 30%. So I wanted to just give you a list of the medications and just uh, generally give you an overall idea. I've said medications old and new. These are the older medications which are 
in 2005 and earlier. Metformin is the most common medication which is used out there. The sulfonylureas, this is the glipizide, the glimepiride, and the gliburide. And you also have uh, pioglitazone or actose. So, uh, all these are pretty much generics nowadays. Prandin and ripaglinide, which is ripaglinide, and also natiglinide, which is Starlex, comes in this. Acarbose, not very widely used. Some physicians still use it. And older insulins are there in this group. And in the newer group, we have DPP-4 inhibitors like Genuvia, Ungliza. These are the once a week and once daily injections, GLP-1s. These help to lose weight and also curb your appetite and control blood sugars. Uh, Trulicity, Ozempic. The SGLT2 group, which are uh, newer medications, have come in the last five to six years. The names are Jardians, Invokana, Farsiga, Steglatro. They also help to control blood sugars. You do lose weight and also help to, some of them are indicated to protect the kidneys. Insulin, the newer insulins are there, the 2JO, Traceba. There are combination of insulin and the GLP-1 group also, which is once a day injections. And there's also a medication called Cyclocet, which works on the brain to control your sugars. So why do we need so many medications? That's the question sometimes uh, patients ask me. So we previously, until maybe the year 2000, something like that, we only thought blood sugars were because the pancreas didn't produce insulin and maybe you had insulin resistance. So that was involving this organ, the pancreas here, and the insulin resistance, you can say maybe the liver and to some extent the muscle. But after over the last 10, 15 years, or 15 years, I should say, we have found a lot more, and also kidneys also. The kidney was previously just a bystander bearing the brunt of the high sugars. Now we have medications which help to control blood sugars using the kidney as a mechanism. And it also protects the kidneys. So it's a very busy slide, means uh, it's uh, mainly for, I would say, physicians, but I would just wanted to show you this, that the ADA, the American Diabetes Association, has actually revamped how they think about diabetes in the last couple of years. So pre metformin is still the first drug which is used along with diet and exercise. But if you have any heart disease, if someone has a previous history of heart disease or heart failure, immediately you go into a different group. You have to use either the once a week medications, the GLP-1 or once daily GLP-1, or you have to use the HGLT-2s, which is the Jardians, the Invokanas. And then it, the other thing they're looking at is, okay, compelling the need to minimize hypoglycemia. So what are the medications which can, does not cause too many low sugars? So the, that is the, the, these are this group. And a lot of times you may have to use multiple medications. It may be two or three or even four medications. And then if you have to promote weight loss, the, the, the different group is there, which is pretty much the same group as here. And if cost is a major issue, because some of these medications are not generics and cost can be an issue. So again, as I said, you more than likely have to use multiple medications to treat the blood sugars. So all these medications we have to use with diet and exercise. I usually tell my patients, exercise only on the days you eat. If, if you don't eat, you don't need to exercise. So you also have to see the diabetic ed educators and the dietitians when diagnosed. I am a very strong proponent of that because I f personally have seen if patients go for their education classes, they do better in the long run. And it has been shown in studies too. And it's a 10 class program initially when you're diagnosed. So Medicare patient can get education every year. There are two sessions with the educator and two sessions with the dietitian. And Definitely, that's an ongoing sort of refresher course will help the patients. Exercise, 30 minutes of aerobic activity at least five days a week, and strength training also recommended. So dental exam. Every six months, you have to see the dentist. Avoid gum disease, brushing at least twice a day, and flossing once a day. So mainly, you have to avoid the periodontal disease or the gum disease because that is at a high, that will give, uh, leads you to a higher risk of heart disease and so on and so forth. So that's what you need to avoid. So I exam at least once a year, 
and if your eye doctor or the optometrist say you may have to come back sooner, then, then you may have to see them sooner. Again, I said both either ophthalmologist or optometrist, and this is in type two patients. As soon as they're diagnosed, you need to get to see them. And in type one patients, they say within the first three to five years after diagnosis, but most of the time we do send them straight away once, once they are diagnosed. Foot care, at least once a year, maybe even often enough, depending upon what the podiatrist thinks. If you're a high risk, can definitely see the foot doctor. As physicians, we definitely try to look at your feet every time you come in. Self-examination of the feet. The patients also have to examine their feet, make sure they don't have any cuts, cracks, bruises, things like that, because mm, those are the ways the bacteria can go into your skin and cause cellulitis and problems or soft tissue infections, which can lead to amputations later on. And the other thing is do not keep the feet dry. You have to keep them moist and so that way there's no cracks and so on and so forth. So vaccinations, flu shot once a year. It's the flu season now, so always uh, definitely if you've not had your flu shot, please have them as long as there's no contraindications for that. Pneumonia, there are two pneumonia vaccines now. One is Prevnar 13, another is the Pneumovax 23. Prevnar 13, you have to get it first after uh, once you hit age 50, the first shot and the pneumovax, you can get it a year after that. And once you get that, the next vaccination of the pneumonia shot will be at age 65. If you've not gotten them, let's say you got your Prevnar 13 at 62 and the pneumovax at 63, then after five years, you get another pneumovax at 68. So that's usually the protocol for the pneumonia shots. And hepatitis B vaccinations for everyone between 19 and 59 years, and for 60 years and older, as per your physician or your care team. So the other thing which we do once a year, in addition to the cholesterol, the A1C, and your liver kidney functions, is the urine albumin creatinine ratio. So this is a urine test which shows if you're leaking any protein in the urine. And this is also an independent risk predictor for heart disease and so on, other, other factors. So you have to check it once a year, and if you're abnormal, you can check it more often, or if they're adjusting your medications, like your blood pressure medications and other things, you can check it more often. And the goal is, needs to be less than 30 milligrams per gram per creatinine. So that's the goal. So vitamin B12, so we don't do this in all patients. Again, if you are on metformin, you can request your physician to do it. I think it's about 10 to 15% or maybe 20% of the patients who take metformin can be deficient in vitamin B12. Or if you have symptoms, if patient comes in, in my case, if they complain of any symptoms, I definitely do it. So metformin in, in some ways blocks the absorption of this vitamin B12 can do it and if you are low definitely you need to go on b12 supplementation and recheck it again care care plan review so every three to six months again if you're controlled you see your physician for six months if you're not controlled three to four months at least many of my patients with diabetes i see them even sooner maybe four or six weeks because if i'm changing medications or changing therapies discuss about the medication list what medications do they need to be on are they on the right medications when are they supposed to take it Low sugars, definitely, if you're on diabetic medications, the hypoglycemia or low sugars is very underreported, okay? Uh, that is one thing you have to talk to your physicians. If you're having low sugars, first thing is you need to check your sugars. Do, you don't want to just not check your sugars. If you're able to check your sugars, just check your sugars, and then also talk to your physician about it. And future appointments and uh, blood work, when to be done, when do they need to, when do they need to see the physician again? So that concludes my talk.